really excited to be here and really excited to meet you guys and have the conversation with, with you. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, no pressure on, on sticking around the whole hour. Excited to just get a, a very different perspective on governance than a lot of the conversations that take place around the Web3 space. So yeah, just appreciate uh, y'all jumping in. So I guess I'll hand it off to, to the three of you to just do some intros and then we can kind of start chatting uh, chatting a little bit about Deep Springs and, and what y'all seeing uh, are seeing on self-governance overall. Um, cool, um, I'll start. Um, um, my name is Hazel Divjani. Um, we, uh, we, we're calling from Deep Springs College. Obviously this is part of our library and um, I'm personally, I'm a political science student. I'm a little more in the Web3 space than uh, most people here. And right now, um, I'm excited to get more involved in with SCURF and like uh, studying a little bit more on um, political theory and how it translates to like governance models and like democracy in like in the DAO space. Um, yeah, that, that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, Deep Springs in general isn't super online. Um, so not everybody is like super like it's familiar with the web three lingo, but we are all, ex we think about governance a whole lot. And we think about like the health of like, yeah, we think about what it means to self govern, what, when is self governance healthy? Um, what does local community mean? And what does scale mean? And those are all uh, topics we are extremely interested in. I'm Declan, uh, I was born in New York city, but now I'm in charge, uh, I'm a student in charge of the farm and uh, yeah, farm operation here at the college. Um, yeah, so it's pretty funny to, to think of that in the context of uh, like a web three self-governance thing, given that it's way more low tech, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I run the farm here. I also was the um, uh, head of the applications committee. So I ran um, admissions for students um, or I was in charge of the committee that ran that. Um, yeah, I'm also really big into political theory, political science. Um, yeah, kind of, I'm kind of interested to see the uh, the, the self governance connection here. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, my name is Brandon Pina. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Here, I'm, I'm a first year student, and yeah, as as, as all they said, uh, I'm interested in political theory. I specifically what I'm doing right now is coordinating like the small animal um, project here and doing a accreditation or reflection form for the college. And I guess the big big thing for me here is is trying to take away is the idea of scale and self governance. I think here we do it in this small locality, but I would, yeah, I would love to hear more about how you all interact with governance in your own ways. For sure. Absolutely, yeah, and I appreciate again y'all joining today. And yeah, I mean, I think it's right, especially when thinking about just DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations, which is just like fancy uh, Web three lingo for co ops that use blockchains. Uh, I guess that, that's one way of reducing it. I'd be interested if anyone wants to push back on that definition of DAOs. But um, yeah, it's just interesting to think about, especially when starting with a small, tight-knit community, what the similarities and differences look like when it comes to something that's so uh, very much off-chain with what y'all are doing at Deep Springs for certain communities in the Web3 space. But even before we delve into some of the specifics of... Um, of comparisons and just talking to you all about self-governance and your your experience there if you don't mind just providing a little more color on what deep springs is all about because we did share the write-up that hazel put together i'm not sure everyone had a chance to take a look at it so it'd be great if you don't mind just uh for the group just mentioning what deep springs is all about i do that um deep springs is a two-year college in the uh, middle of the the mountain desert in uh, Eastern California. Um, we uh, are a liberal arts college with uh, uh, professors, we're accredited, um, and uh, yeah, students spend their morning taking classes. Um, a lot of a lot of the, uh, I guess the focus of the classes is political science, social science, um, uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, then we usually spend our afternoon or sometimes, I guess, pre-dawn um, uh, doing uh, labor. Um, so running the uh, farm operation, ranch operation. Um, we've, we've got uh, uh, a few hundred head of cattle. And we have some uh, for beef that we, that we sell. And we also have dairy cows um, that we, so we produce all the milk for the college with dairy. Um, the farm is alfalfa, which we use to, to to make hay and feed all the feed all the cows that we're selling for beef. Um, we have a garden, um, uh, and then we 
know, student labor positions for for cook and washing with housekeeping stuff. Um, and then uh, we also students um, students are in charge of kind of all the uh, or a good chunk at least of the administrative and bureaucratic work that uh, I guess a modern college, even one our size, which we only have twenty seven students. Um, but uh, depends on so um, admissions. Uh, I is the applications committee, which has uh, two staff and faculty members, but is uh, eleven students, and um, and I was the the chair of that committee. There's a, another committee on communications that does media inquiries. Um, uh, another on hiring uh, professors, um, all student run, um, and then and that's in addition to every Friday night we we have a student body meeting where the entire twenty seven of us. Um, uh, meet uh, and and discuss, you know, pass motions, use Robert's rules, etc., um, and and kind of have a parliamentary uh, system, more or less, that that determines, um, yeah, a lot of the inner workings of college. Um, um, what would be a good example, I guess, of an SBE decision um, mm -hmm. that, that that had stakes that we did recently? Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like this gets into like um, the question of what does self governance mean in in Deep Springs, and I think the yeah, the, the like range of that is pretty broad. Um, um, yeah, I think like we decide things from like stupid things like, oh, like we're going on the trip to um, deep strings of ground rules of like, we don't allow drug and alcohol on campus and we are isolated. So we don't leave the campus. Um, and like, for example, we can vote on if we, can, we want to breach um, the ground rules by a two thirds majority vote. Um, and I think there are, we talk about a lot of things, like for example, even like, with our relationship with our college president, um, to what extent do we want to advocate for like renewing or not renewing the president's contract? Um, to um, what else is uh, to COVID policies and vaccination policies have been like a huge example like in the past, like huge, um, yeah, huge discussion in the past year of like to what extent do we want to allow for vaccine like exemption because we're small and close and we don't have to follow a lot of the other colleges' protocols. Um, um, what else is a self-governance example? We can determine whether we'd like to recommend the expulsion of a student. Um, uh, or imitation yeah. of a student. Imitation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, no, thank you all for, for providing that context. And I guess just to make sure, because I, I guess in my mind, I just assumed the, the self, the, the focus of Deep Springs was on kind of a self-sustaining, say, agricultural environment, but it sounds like it's an actual agribusiness where you're selling uh, beef. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it gets into the, like, um, the, the budget and the operation side of Deep Springs. I think we do have an endowment of like 20, about $30 million, um, which is like a sizable amount for such a small college, but definitely like still not that it's not like extreme it's not that secure let's say and i think like, yeah we do like our annual like you know, we, we do sell a lot of things and we do like annual fundraising that goes into the like annual operations and i think as student body we um we are like in the community we have a lot of conversation about how do you want to like manage our endowment what sort of investment that we want to do right now we're in the middle of like trying to work out divestment of like moving our funds to like fossil free sources um uh that's like a long conversation and 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 we also talk about just like more in a more like theoretical way like to what extent should we have an endowment like to what extent is this like ethical and like necessary for for this like nonprofit college yeah that's interesting uh josh do you want to bring up that question directly or i can read it off mike if you can't hop on uh, off me uh no worries i can just speak it um yeah so i was just curious um the endowment is quite large especially for that number of students right um if i remember correctly deep springs is completely like free right it's like a full scholarship um so the fact that it can run that way is yeah it's it's like it's, it's quite insane um so this is where like in some sense most of the resources besides like the land value that enables the college to run um you know sits so how is that endowment actually governed um and what to what degree are let's say students um you know allowed to participate in those decisions as opposed to i usually think of like endowment management as a very technical and specialized process where you know letting uh let's face it like you know most of us are just amateurs uh in on that process can be let's say cause diminishing returns quite literally right um no thanks for the question josh um 
yeah I, I think right now like i i think we only have like sort of like we are also like just in the in the like um uh, state of like learning about it and the i think i believe the endowment is managed by deep springs like board of trustees we have a board of trustees that like, come in but doesn't really like um get in the way of the like daily operation of the college but they're there they are there to manage the endowment and every year we elect a student to sit on the like to, to like two students to sit on the like uh, board of trustees to vote um to like make decisions with them and talk talk through uh budget and operations with them and i think the reason part of the reason why we have such a loud large endowment is our annual operations come from like a like five percent investment draw um from the endowment that we don't the, yeah and i think that's how like, it goes into the the like any operation like paying the salary managing the ranch like buying fertilizers buying farm equipment and um things like that and so i guess on that note i would wonder what is the decision landscape that is sort of managed what is not managed by the students is there anything besides say the board of trustees overseeing certain aspects of the endowment is there anything else that is kind of left to either the board or the trustees or is it pretty much i know you're mentioning the, the students are involved in in the operations of the farm uh in the selection process of other students and potential expulsions like you know, are there clear lines that get drawn around that there are um staff and faculty members mm -hmm. um uh there's and there's a college president and a college dean um uh i'd say most of their role is oversight um or i, I kind of like you're saying like drawing those boundaries um or, or at least like um, embodying those boundaries, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we have a ranch manager who is my boss, um, who is, and, and I think the, the number one thing actually that, that they bring, um, in addition to like, I guess, uh, you know, the uh, adults who can communicate with, you know, um, especially the dean who can communicate with, with other colleges that students will transfer to and, and kind of put a, a face that, um, that that seems from the outside more legitimate than if it was a, a 19 year old calling which which we still do for hiring faculty which is its own interesting thing um and then also manage a lot of the the bureaucratic work um uh but i'd say uh the number one thing actually they bring is longevity and institutional uh, memory um given that students are only here for two years it it is so many things get lost i guess in in that transition process um, where uh, Tim, the, the ranch manager, has been here a decade, uh, almost. Um, and, uh, and because of that, uh, yeah, I mean, it has, has a sense of the way things were done where, um, I don't know, for example, like, we're here in a drought year. Um, and to the, to the extent where that's all that we've experienced, uh, Deep Springs in drought. Um, and it's, it's actually kind of amazing how, how much um, disappears with, uh, yeah, so, but but yeah, you're you're right that those uh, those lines do exist, and I think pushing those lines is is definitely the uh, uh, one of the the biggest roles of self governance is yeah fighting fighting for where students want to um, want to want to have a say. And just to add on a little bit to that, I think trustees also like their oversight is sort of legal oversight. I think if people know about Deep Springs, we were I'm the third year of Colette and Brandon there like the fourth year of Colette so like we had a, like a huge legal lawsuit um surrounding transitioning deep springs to to Colette um it was like a 10-year like long like lawsuit process because there's one trustee who just wouldn't retire and keep voting no on the board um and then the trustee retired and we became Colette um yeah I think yeah uh, there's also like just legality um con yeah concerning like the college I'm I'm seeing Stephanie's question um which actually is fitting because we're sitting in the archives right now, um, which is a large way that um, uh, tacit knowledge and, and um, general memory is, is maintained. Um, there's a student archivist who's elected, um, and this is, uh, their, their job is to kind of articulate some of this. There's also minutes that are taken for every student body meeting that um, kind of, I guess, right behind where the computer is line the, the walls. Um, and all the way since 1917, when the college was, was founded, um, which is just kind of just incredible to, to go look through. Um, and yeah, I feel like every time I've done that, it's been like a kind of a shocking sense of perspective. Also alum visiting, we, we recently passed a motion that um, all alum visiting will be asked to give a speech. Um, uh, and so and there aren't that many of us, or there aren't that many alums, so it's totally doable. Um, uh, but it's kind of incredible to, to hear the way things were. Um, 
things things were different, things were similar. Um, but it is true that this place readily evolves. And we, there's kind of a joke here that tradition is invented if something stays it's the same for two years. Then the third year, every, the only, the only every, it has always been that way for the, the students who were here in that, that third year. Um, but uh, yeah, the archives are the, the main way to do that. And I guess a quick clarifying question on that, if it's roughly 26, 27 students, is it fair to assume that it's roughly half and half of first year, second year, or does it not always work out that evenly for whatever reason? Oh, it's even every year. Declan can speak to this. Like every year we admit 13, 14 students. Yeah. Got it. And so I wonder then whether to, to build on what Stephanie was asking about and what you were just mentioning, Declan, like how much is there a training process from archivist to, from student archivist to student archivist, or is it just someone kind of opts into it and then you just have to catch up and go read everything the, the person wrote last year and just kind of start from there? There's kind of like a stair stairway effect for most positions of a senior position and a junior position, um, uh, and the and it's generally passed on that way, um, and that that's pretty much from the most important positions. That's the case with cowboy. There's a there's actually a which is which is the the most prestigious position at the college. Um, labor, labor wise. Labor wise, yeah. Um, a student is actually asked to come back for a third year and spend an entire year with the, the junior cowboy in training. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's kind of like a, a, a stairway effect. That, that's That's really cool. Uh, yeah, Chris, please. I know you already dropped one in chat. I don't know if you had another yeah. one or a follow on. Yeah, this is like, so I I hear there's an endowment and then I hear there's labor. So it, it's like, do the students do labor and the labor supplement costs for the year? Or is that just an experiment? Because I'm like, if there's a $30 million endowment, the amount of work it sounds like you all are doing seems to, like, like when do they sleep? Um, and that's where I'm like, the, the school work, the administrative work, and then the physical labor, that's why I'm like, if there was a $30 million endowment in which there's more than a million dollars per student, it seems like there's a lot of work going on with still products being made and then the endowment. So I'm trying to figure out, like, is the endowment purely for security and then the business, the agribusiness for operation or is agribusiness just an experiment because it's, it's like from my perspective it sounds like if i was a student there i would not have time to sleep but then there would also be a million dollars sitting there for me that i was not being it was not being used on me. that's how that's how it sounds that's why i'm like and maybe I'm, i must be missing something i Oh, we have plenty of time to sleep between two and six thirty. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I think I think you're you're actually hitting on like the point, which is I think um, the uh, I think there's like a radical shift in what what and how like one views what college is and who college is for when you're here, um, in the sense that like I don't know. It's I mean I remember thinking something similar when I first got here of like. How, how many millions of dollars per person, you know, does this college then is this college equipped for? But it's funny when you're when you're here, it's totally like the work is 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 what you want to do. The work is the, the pedagogical experience um, and the what fosters the community. Um, uh, and it's, it's not so much like uh, I mean, it's not like the slave laborer because we're not getting and we're not getting paid or anything like that. Um, it is it is like be the prestigious thing to do. Um, yeah, and what we're all here for, and then the, I mean, the agribusiness largely pays for itself. It doesn't really, it doesn't really make a profit, and it doesn't really pay for the operations of the academic side of things, um, which is largely funded through um, investment uh, and alum donations. Um, but I, I guess I, I'm trying to articulate like a more, um, like a more satisfying answer to that, um, which, which is just, I guess, like it seems like there is a. Um, a, a being for community or living through community and, and and a sense of entitlement in terms of like students want to say and students want um a political voice and less of like a entitlement for amenities and and goods and, and things that the endowment could provide and i think there's actually kind of like a distaste for like the perception of getting something that um that we didn't earn ourselves um 
so I, like the, the new, there was a, the dorm building for the students was, was built uh, in the 1990s and that was super controversial and students actually boycotted it, um, the, which was the product of a multi-million dollar alum donation um, uh, for the sense that it kind of felt vain. Students, students had built a lot of the original buildings on campus and this was, and con crew came, was contracted to the new dorms and that was like, it's like a failure on the part of the student body and, um, and largely these are like, you know, code has changed since the 1920s. Um, students aren't probably, are not in the state of California allowed to, to build buildings like that anymore. But there is like a, um, there's a degree of, of pride, I think, that comes in like, in doing something for oneself that I think just drawing from the endowment wouldn't, wouldn't give. Yeah. Which to me gets at the larger question of like motivation and incentive um, on, on, like, on, in some ways is definitely like the narrative going around. Um, and there's just a lot of things going into it. And I guess on that note, I mean, when you're involved in, in thinking of future students coming in and fostering that community, sort of how much of it is dictated by self-selection versus how much of it is a, a process-oriented thing. And you really need to think about, you know, the nuances of how to select students because some folks might really, you know, think it's one thing and then it's a whole other reality once they get there. Uh, I guess maybe if I could just like generally talk about the admissions process, it's kind of it's it's kind of crazy because it's I think it's it's super intense. We ask students to write um, twelve essays, all of them are fairly long, um, and, and it's broken into two sections. So initially, there's a first round of a few hundred applicants, um, uh, and five for six essay questions, um, uh, and then the kind of the top tier of that round top. 40 or 50 or so are, are drawn, and those students are actually invited to visit the college um, to see it for themselves for exactly the yeah, reason you were indicating. Um, uh, and from there, usually like, I'd say five or six students back out and realize it's not for them once once they see it. Um, and, and when they're here, we interview them, we watch them labor, we kind of just like observe them live here for four days. Um, uh, and then and they're also asked to write another six essays. Um, but uh, yeah, and in the end, we we drop thirteen from that from that forty or fifty. Um, and 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 I guess the first round is very much shifted in terms of like prioritizing merit, prioritizing like the ability of someone to do well here. And the second round is more crafting a class, crafting like um, the group that will that will carry different elements and also exist well with with each other. Um, I think that's is that is that kind of where you were where you were getting at. I mean, I guess, uh, yes, thank you for, for adding that color. And I guess more broadly, I would want to maybe pan that out to what is building community like here? Like how much is that already a form thing that students plug into versus how much is that something you feel like you actually have to curate and structure year over year? Um, no, I feel like that's a diff like definitely a very difficult question. Like we definitely think a lot about like what what community means in this space. Um, and I think it's it's like just that is very is fairly complicated. Like for example, we are like a political community. So we have like a public life and public persona and public decision making, but we also like live together. Um, and, and we also live fairly closely as like friends or even like in this like commune way. So we our private life is, is also like fairly transparent. Like Declan is my like like roommate. And and it's just um, the private and public and like political life is fairly intertwined um, with like a set of complications um, that's like fairly like in, in like inseparable like much unlike like how like in online spaces like there's like a public and private persona that you can separate and, and I wonder like yeah like yes. when you talk about community Eugene like I wonder what specifically like which aspect you're most interested in yeah, I mean, that's so fascinating, right? Because I always think about sort of what is at the core of building community. And, and Chris, sorry, I'll hand it off to you after, after just responding here. But it's just one of those elements that I do wonder how much can you have community when, the more it's separated from everything else in one's life. And I, I, for me personally, sort of the blurring of those lines is you're mentioning the personal and the professional and the passion and the whatever else, the more those kind of become its own layer cake and have more of a melding there, the more there's just a depth to connection that makes it okay to work through disagreements that make, you know, like we might all have a collective goal of 
you know, like, let's just say at SCURP, we're all here to support research around Web3. And like, sure, that sounds like a very vague thing. And I imagine, you know, even just the people on this call, um, at least who are SCURPers, like those of us uh, who are here, I imagine we have very different reasons of being here and why we're here and what gets us out of bed every morning and that kind of thing. And then on the other end, there's the, you know, once you have a multi-million person community, how tenuous is that connection or how much is it just kind of like this little badge of honor that you wear, but it's okay if it gets lost because you don't have that much skin in the game. And I, I feel like the more it is deeply intertwined in that way, the more there's just this inherent commitment to the labor, to the passion. And like, I don't just mean labor in the physical labor sense, but just like the work that it is to build a community because we're all selfish creatures with different desires and to get us all to align to a cohesive goal and narrative takes a lot of work and energy and you need to be willing to, unless you're trying to like bulldoze and just say like, oh, my view is our community, which then arguably like, is that really a community or is that just one person uh, pulling people into their orbit and where does the line get drawn between those? And in my mind, like a true community is a group of people with different goals, different agendas, but who come in with a shared passion and that shared passion, uh, they are willing to, uh, to trump certain elements of their ego to enjoy some of the fruits of that shared passion and whatever might come of it. So, yeah, I don't know how much of that. Uh, and, and if anyone else kind of ha wants to think about or define the community differently than that, please do. But yeah, I wonder how much of um, just the the sort of super deep community is inevitable in something like what you're what y'all are doing at Deep Springs because of how much you have to quite literally commit to what's going on uh, and for two years uh in order to be able to to build that and what can larger communities even if it's 100 to 200 people forget millions right but do we need that level of depth and working together in that kind of committed way or are there other ways to to bring people together in that kind of committed passionate way yeah i guess i can answer this um uh yeah you know i'm I'm kind of, um, it's, it's interesting to the extent to which like traditionalism is kind of uh, something people find here um, in, in a strange way. Um, and uh, in, in, I guess in the sense that there becomes like a, a common constitution of values um, that not necessarily everyone subscribes to, but that is the center that everyone is is kind of reckoning with or, or working around. Um, and, and I think in, um, I think in a large sense, like that has been the, <laughs> that has been the, um, like what makes the Deep Springs political space what it is, I guess. Um, and, and I wonder to what degree that translates. Um, uh, yeah, but, but it is interesting that that is the, uh, I, I guess it creates sort of a, a degree of shared terms and shared uh, language. Um, uh, and and it, I guess it like, puts the the political sphere in a in a certain area where where deep springs is very much and deep springs values and the fight to define what that means is very much at the center um yeah yeah i'm sorry i need to jump off brendan is we're switching device um thank you guys and there the two of them will still be here bye cool thanks for joining hazel and thanks for helping set it up thank you See, I realize I, I kind of monopolized some of the question asking there. So, Chris, first of all, I know you had uh, virtually raised you guys your hand, so okay. I just want to check in with you. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, for some reason, you're showing up on your side. Uh, if you don't mind, just, yeah, beautiful. Lovely. Thank you, yeah. Brandon. So, yeah, Chris, did you want to jump in with what you were virtually raising your hand for before? Yeah, so to kind of follow up on the community question, um, it seems as if there has to be a sort of commitment to the base ideals uh, to be part of the community. And in that, it's not that people are not motivated by money so much as uh, monetary compensation doesn't become their main reason for being there. So that's where on that, from that context, does this seem like something that could possibly scale or is it something that could only exist in a gated community or an isolationist community in that the gate is where people 
decide that they agreed on these sets of values. Whereas if this culture was attempted to be disseminated across the United States, it would probably get rejected because of tradition. Um, not to say that it's bad, but it's because of the traditions that are in place, this type of culture would, you know, it's it's just, it's going to get rejected because of resist, just natural resistance to change. So that's where, in your experience, does it seem like something that is easy to transition, uh, I guess you have to transition out of it. Is it something that one could possibly transition out of after transitioning in because it's such a cultural shift? Because that's why I'm like, it seems like once you go into Deep Springs, it's like you're, you're pretty much in there as a student and then into faculty. And it's because of the two year change, it's like you're almost there for life. Or, I mean, I don't know how people get involved or leave. It seems like that type of shift is not going to be easy to shift back into American money first uh, motivation. So that's where I'm like, is it is it something as an experiment that is meant to stay small or are they trying to figure out what can scale up? I guess from, from the inside, how does it stay? Yeah, I, I, I guess right now I'm wondering why is it that people come here or like, let's say for me, why did I come here, right? And the, the reason it comes online with the, the statement of this call is the mission statement, which is like to prepare you for the life of service. And I think for me, the, the key word is preparing. Uh, as in, I don't see this. I, I when I, I, I like, uh, I enjoyed being here because of this, 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 this isn't like a shortcut for a result. Like I imagine this being like a form for me to figure out a truth that I want as in somehow after this, I want to apply all the things I'm learning here to an outside like institution or my communities or places I go to. I, I think there's a lot of skills here that are beneficial for it. And honestly, most places anywhere, maybe even. And yeah, I think these alumni, the people that are, are after us or before us, are the people that are also bringing these values and these things they they loved from being here to other places. And there is like companies or institutions from like alumni that have brought up like these same values that we have here for sure. But I mean, Chris, I'm kind of like um, mm -hmm. I I think on the admissions committee we do try to to bring people who who have like I guess who, who seem interested in Deep Springs and who seem mm -hmm. um like like they want something that more um than than what they can find elsewhere and that, that Deep Springs could offer. But I, I also think that it's like incredibly imperfect at doing that. And I mm -hmm. think plenty of people definitely filter like escape I guess the filtration whatever process. Mm -hmm. Um and and do come here who who don't um I don't know, who don't share the initial values of the projects or are, are kind of disgusted by the elitist nature of it or the isolation nature. Um, and I, I think I think a lot of the values are actually um, stem from from being here. And I, I don't think I think most people um, probably even if they think they have a, uh, an articulation of the, the Deep Springs values, don't really learn what those are until they're here, which is which is a way of saying, like, I think it's actually the structure of this place that. Um, that determines um, that 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 determines the the political uh, uh, leanings and landscape, and I guess the uh, because the line between political and personal is so uh, narrow here, or so so um, fine. It seems like uh, that's sort of the development process of students. I guess is like this this general process of coming into this environment that is entirely foreign um, and isn't and is incredibly. Um, opinionated and uh, I guess like has its own culture has its own ways and it seems like um, most students come in with with no sense of that at all totally that is contrary to everything that they've um, that they've grown up thinking and believing and and then it's the structure that um, uh, that that shapes the the discourse until the discourse becomes like one's whole self um, in a certain way and and then I don't I don't know how the question of scale would impact that. I think I think for this particular structure, it has to be small and it has to be isolated. But I do wonder um, uh, to what degree uh, a structure that that is less to, less less physical, less honestly like less farm and ranch centered. Um, I, I do think that like uh, yeah, that there there is a there is a lesson to be learned, I guess, for um, 
the impact a, a certain structure can have on the, the political discourse and then the individuals within that within that discourse, um, which I think could scale up. And I guess coming back to a, a question that Loretta had asked earlier, you know, how many of the courses are deeply values uh, and political focused and how much of that is driven by kind of student desire for classes and in turn, I guess, remnants of the previous cohort? Because if it is predominantly student driven and y'all just appear as first years, then I'm assuming it's kind of second years and the recent graduates who kind of dictated that. Is there a lot of change in that or is there a pretty consistent value set and focus area that at least predominantly stays consistent year over year? Hmm. Um, yeah, I say that well, I think uh, our community, I, I feel like is especially like we rely on a lot of the people from the second year or the people before us. And with that, I say like the language that we have is usually shared by like the people before us or even let's say the teachers that have been here, uh, their interests also become our interests. And that's because we're interested let's say, in this shared like, community that we have here. And it creates a shared language. Uh, not to say like every class is a direct like embodiment of like what it is it that we want to like put into our laboring or our like um, governing we have we still have stem classes for sure right and but still there i think we we, we apply these languages that we learn from there into our everyday for sure yeah it's cool and there was another question from loretta on do you see yourself applying some of the governance tools from school to your daily lives outside of school uh, mm -hmm. or at least from what you hear from alumni, like how much do they port over the knowledge and structures of what they learn into uh, their work, their personal environment, their activism, whatever else they get involved in? I, um, you're catching me at a funny time for that question. I've been, I've been reading a lot of Hannah Arendt, <laughs> um, which uh, I guess like the, yeah, the Arendt I've been reading is, is a lot, uh, it is emphasizing the importance of intentionality and thinking for oneself. Um, uh, and, and yeah, kind of with, with every action, um, thinking for oneself. Um, and it seems like that's what everything sort suddenly becoming political has, has made, made me do. Um, uh, like every, every, the tiniest thing, am I like going through the implications, going through the stakes, um, uh, which is kind of, which I think makes, makes life a lot more tiring and is, is, uh, makes, slows things down for sure. Um, but I, yeah, I do think is something that has become like a impossible not to do at this point. And, and then, um, yeah, hearing some from recent alum who have transferred to other institutions, um, I guess just like hearing about the, especially with the, the very bureaucratic nature of the, the modern university, hearing just like the kind of the way things are done that seems like no one really thought to make them that way they just kind of wound up output of the system type of thing um that just sort of i think drives a lot of students here really crazy um but i think there is a a demand for for that kind of intentionality that um yeah i think i think the one thing a deep springer could never could never become as a bureaucrat by any means because even though we do a lot of bureaucracy here it's, it seems directly antithetical to mm -hmm. the, the, the takeaway i guess yeah, I think like with the image of implications, like we, honestly, in my head right now is that thought is like common sense. Like we, yeah, common sense. We usually think of it as like it, it is, it's unconscious. But I think everything we do, we we honestly think of like the implications, and we have to like explain to ourselves and to others like why we're we doing this. And yeah, I think with that, that gives us a lot of imagination or political imagination to actually act on our the things that we want to do. And in that regard, honestly, it might not be the most efficient way of doing it, but in that way, it is the most honest and sincere way we can do things for sure. Because as we're working together, we're actually acting with conviction. Yeah, yeah and that also that makes me think, because I know as, as someone who uh, heritage wise comes from the Soviet Union and in general, like I went to business school undergrad, so generally not a lot of positive vibes towards, you know, a bureaucracy as this like monster that slows things down. Um, but then from a systems design perspective, you know, bureaucracy is sort of those points where some slowing down is needed to ensure in its purest and good form, right? Like bureaucracy is intended to make sure things that don't go off the rails and that they happen in a way that doesn't break the system. And just hearing both of you talk there, 
just made me think of the idea of intentionality as its kind of personal level form of bureaucracy, right? Because you slow yourself down to say like, hey, where am I actually headed? And let me make sure this fits into a bigger picture that I might not always realize if I'm just always barreling forward, barreling forward, barreling forward. Um, no particular question there. That was just our, our articulating an emotional response to what both of you were just saying. Um, but yeah, I did want to jump in because uh, I see, uh, yeah, there was another question that Chris had asked on what you were on the notebook you were just saying. What's the ratio of kind of admins to students there, roughly? Let's see. We've got uh, a president and a dean. Um, who else would you consider admin? Um, right. And then, then again, those are all for teachers. I'm saying, like, right, both of them teach classes as well. Yeah. They are teachers. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So probably two to two to twenty seven. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then are for the teachers? Then are they? Can they possibly be tenured? Like, can you fire them as a teacher but not as a administrator? Um, the way that I guess Deep Springs like officially has no tenure. Um the uh there are there are long-term chairship positions um which which uh yeah which, which do exist and and with those responsibilities um someone is then expected to be participating in these sort of admissions committee uh uh curriculum committee etc like those types of um self-governance work with the students um and, and the dean and president are, are likewise mm -hmm. um hmm. um I don't, I mean, it seems like, honestly, the people wear many hats here. And I think if people aren't wearing many hats, they're, they're not, um, they're not, they're, they, they're taking up space here. Um, uh, and, and, yeah, I think the wearing of many hats is the, is part of the requirement. Um, no one's a one, th no one's one thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine. We do have visiting faculty who come and teach and don't do, don't participate in the rest of the community, but that's, that's kind of the. Uh, they're they're visiting, I guess. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. And I wanted to jump back to a question that Stephanie dropped in the chat earlier, which is that this is such a unique experience. Are there specific values from this time in your lives that are guiding uh, what your next steps might be or next moves might be to quote entirely? Mm -hmm. Um, if not everything right, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd imagine the value of like actually talking or like patience with yourself and with others. Uh, I think here, my, my big like, uh, effort I have is how seen like the, how shared, the, or how independent, uh, interdependent we are to each other. Like this is self-governance, but I don't, I don't imagine the student body being this creature of like, of authoritative, like jurisdiction over the college i think we all have a conversation that we all are all holding here uh in the in, like charity and i would love to bring that back to anywhere else or even like the family or like to whatever job i get later on and yeah i don't know like say the farm that's that's something i think critically about as in like even like the food that we get here and eating and the way that we grow things and the way we act in that regard and it's like working it's these working skills of like teamwork leadership of honestly experimenting and failing failing is a big thing for me here now and as in like taking criticism and having people check on you also is something that honestly i haven't experienced anywhere else in this regard and wouldn't that be great to have other people in, in like outside the space also experience that of being able to win it to be willing to take that criticism to heart and appreciate that and grow from it Yeah, and I guess on, on that note, when it comes to, right, because it sounds as though almost all, if not the entirety of the governance uh, at Deep Springs is very much offline, in person, very <laughs> personal in that sense. What are your, what are your general feelings on kind of how, do you see ways that tech can actually help in the kind of environment where you're at? Or is it just that uh, tech and governance end up fundamentally talking about different environments? given the fundamental nature of what Deep Springs is focused on? I think there is a similarity in 
oddly enough in isolation and um and at least the limited uh knowledge that i have of web3 um uh which is that like they both seem like they're exercises in world building to some extent um and and they're they're intaking um people who are, who are coming from kind of a uh the general i don't know american landscape um and are bringing them to a place that they've never been um that is unlike anything that they've experienced beforehand and is because of that because of its isolation and, and here because of the desolateness is able to to set new terms um and uh and and i think people i think people here and myself included have, have um have, yeah have been in, in awe of, of i guess like the degree of personal transformation that the, that type of process um allows one to do um and honestly i think i think i want to i want to go back to like elements of pride and elements mm -hmm. of like um that that a shared endeavor um is is uh that that world building kind of enables um uh yeah and definitely like a um yeah sense of pride yeah on the sense of pride like i sometimes wonder like being here like do i am i actually impacting this place that much or like is my am i gonna be remembered or am i gonna have am i actually benefiting this cause other than other than me and myself like benefiting from it or like taking things from it and trying to see that as it means to somewhere else. I guess saying that is like I I imagine that the people after me will, will find like meaning on what I've done here and or what have my class has done here. Which is like I think that's something prideful. Or I think like I imagine Web3 like it's honestly like pushing forward something that it's still vague or ambiguous to eyes me. And but pushing forward that like the people after us would be the ones that or appreciate it even more than I say how I was like working here. Yeah, it's really interesting to think what you're saying about the world building side, just because I it's that that's a really great way of putting it. And I feel like some some pockets, only a few pockets of the Web3 space, I feel like are fully capturing the importance of the world building aspect around the community and culture and everything else that's happening. And I always like using Gitcoin as a real uh, good example. Uh, they pretty much like uh, started by just doing like bounties for the health and development of a specific ecosystem. But like now they've gotten all the way to like having their own lore and having their own like mythology that they're building up and literally releasing comics and whatnot and how much that helps the world building. And yeah, I, I just really thought that was an interesting way of putting it because as someone on the outside, I would not have assumed like that's a framing when it's such a tight knit community, but it also tremendously uh, makes sense. But my little ramble aside, I know Chris has his virtual hand up, so I'll pass it <laughs> off to him. Thanks. Um, so on, it's, it's on the same note. Um, based on all the things I've heard, do you both, I mean, I'm obviously, you know, it's, it's an opinion, but do you think what is possible at Deep Springs would be possible in an online environment because it feels like a lot of the community, the, the sense of humanity of each other comes from seeing each other so frequently, whether it's at work, on the farm, or um, in the meetings. So that's where I'm like, does the physical contact end up being the defining element as to why that community can exist the way it does and do you think this would be possible like if someone worked at home and they did physical labor at home and they participated in deep spring classes online and they sent their accumulated labor to a deep springs factory would that like and then they did digital meetings like would that yeah that's like peloton could this could this be turned into a peloton model where everybody does the same things in home in isolation, but still has digital interactions. Because that's why I'm like, if you're in the physical element of it. Do you believe that would be possible if I take if the physical element was taken out and have everything else still exist? I think the big difference is uh, the difference in, uh, the, or at least what the in real life ness here um, provides that. I, I don't know how it would manifest um, uh, in the digital space is is the absence of privacy, quite honestly, um, or at least like kind of uh, uh, tiers, uh, tiers of, of, of uh, decreasing privacy 
um, where one is never alone, but one can be with, alone with their roommates or one can be alone with their significant other or something like that. Um, but one is never actually by themselves unless they just, unless they walk into the desert, which, which people do. Um, but, um, but like, I guess doing their day to day, um, one is never alone. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I want that to transition into the digital space. Cause that seems like it gets into, I don't know, preconceived notions of dystopian, um, uh, panopticon stuff that I, I don't know. I don't, um, so, yeah. I, but, but I, um, I don't think deep spring specifically is, is scalable to the digital world, but I, I don't, but I wonder like different degrees of abstraction from there yeah. or, or different like elements of deep springs that, that could be, um, and, and I, yeah, I, I am still on this train, I think of like, um, world building, meaning like the establishment of a space that has uh that has that has values and then it has, the values have been the product of um and then continue to be the product of intense scrutiny intense discussion intense like politics um uh and and because it's it remains at the center of there um it, it creates a certain core and a certain um yeah a certain language and terms um uh but also uh even even if the where are the values that that span out from are, are diametrically opposite um it that the values are still centered around this this the discussion of this core set of principles seems like what has fostered community here um i think to a larger extent than just you know happenstance seeing everyone over and over again um and i think that is scalable yeah, and that makes me wonder with just thinking of examples from my own life and and talking to others where the only kind of true digital equivalencies of that kind of depth of connection and shared values and everything else is when, um, I mean, cause I, I don't, I'm trying to even think of like with all the folks that I've spoken to who were forced into remote learning around education like that, that did not translate to that of feeling like, oh, well, we're all on Zoom. So it feels like we're in the same classroom and like that did not go the same way. But the one that it did was a distributed team building a product together, like working on a focused project together. And part of it, was the at least the i'm thinking of a number of concrete examples where people said like we were almost always on the phone or on video with each other and like that opting into the limitation of your own privacy not that like one can't have their own thoughts to them or that this is meant to be a surveillance state where you know that kind of stuff gets controlled and like the, the dystopian stuff you're alluding to declan but more of the opting into like feeling uncomfortable because you know there's other people there and like you, you just kind of lean into it and you let that wash over you and you let it stop being uncomfortable and it's just the presence of how it is and just on a personal note I've noticed that as someone who uh, in their mind loves their own little cocoon but then in reality I've noticed that like my depression is lowest when I get over that and I share space with people whether or not I think I want to in any given moment in the long run it causes to like me feeling deeper more deeply connected and embedded with them around like shared values because we can have conversations and work through challenging things. Um, yeah, it's such an interesting thing to think of the the perceived benefits of privacy versus the reality of when is it actually good to opt into having a bit less to help strengthen those kind of bonds. And yeah, I don't know, do, does that kind of resonate with what you were saying before? Or does that feel like a, a different encapsulation or different uh, version than what you were thinking? Um, I guess I'm thinking that the, the one space for privacy there is here is, is a very intentional, um, escape and it's a very, um, or, you know, they're, we're surrounded by mountains and desert. And so, you know, I, as I used to do a bunch when I was upset or depressed or something like that last year, you can, you can walk for two hours and climb one of the nearby mountains and walk along the ridge line to the point where you can't see the college at all. You can't see anyone. You won't run into a single person. Um, you know, you'll probably run into a few rabbits and maybe a few deer, and that'll be the only living thing that you'll really see. Um, uh, but I, I think there is a, like, that is a, that is a definite intentional escape that you're doing. And it's a process that you're, you're doing for a little bit, but you can't sustain on your own. And, and then when you, when you return and you, and you have to return and you run out of water and you get cold when the, the sun goes down, um, you're returning to a, a shared space. Um, and, and so there's no, I guess, ability for like sustained like brooding, I guess, um, or, or, um, cause, cause you're, 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 you can be in solitude, but you, it feels like you, you can both in solitude and be lonely.
Um, uh, but um, yeah, which which I think has been really valuable. Yeah. yeah, right now I'm thinking of the word like like culture, as in here we are building up from each other. And yeah, I'm I'm also thinking about like the little like uh, comment that, that was talking about how in exercising classes online, like we all feel like there's like we're, we're all in there together. But um, I think here like there is the idea of like opting in or like, opting out. In I guess with that is intent being intentional and um. I honestly think that in online like uh, organization, there is a way to be like not alienated from your work, and that is also like the ability to make sure that it's not like something that you're forced to do, and like you actually choosing to do. And I think that's something that I really appreciate for me at being here for sure. Because yeah, at times I could go out in the dark and be by myself and see the moonlight, but um, yeah, in the end we all rely on each other for sure, and we, we I think that's what makes us like feel like we're all part of the community. Right. I guess that's the other thing. You, you're going to have to come back one way or another because the cows need to get milked. Yeah. And, you know, breakfast needs to get made. I will say that I do have a class soon and my, yeah, my phone is going to die soon. Yeah, no, I was going to say this is perfect timing and that was such a great note to end on. So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, both Brandon and Declan, and I'll mention this to Hazel as well. Thank you all so much for joining. This is such a great conversation and insight into a very different governance structure. And yeah, always let us know if there's any questions about Web3 and stuff like that. Always happy to share from our perspective in the future. But yeah, thank you both and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. You too. Yeah, we'll talk.